within physics itself, the study of chaos emerged from a backwater. The mainstream for most of the 20th century has been particle physics, exploring the building blocks of matter at higher energies, smaller and smaller scales, shorter and shorter times. Out of particle physics have come theories about the fundamental forces of nature and about the origin of the universe. Yet, some young physicists have grown dissatisfied with the direction of the most prestigious of sciences. Progress has begun to seem slow, the naming of the new particles futile, the body of theory cluttered. With the coming of chaos, younger scientists believed that they were seeing the beginnings of a, a course change for all of physics. The field had been dominated long enough, they felt, by the glittering abstractions of high-energy particles and quantum mechanics. The cosmologist Stephen Hawking, occupant of uh, Newton's chair at Cambridge University, spoke for most of physics when he took stock of his science in a 1980 lecture titled Is the End in Sight for Theoretical Physics? We already know the physical laws that govern everything we experience in everyday life. It is a tribute to how far we've come in theoretical physics that it now takes enormous machines and a great deal of money to perform an experiment whose results we cannot predict. Yet, Hawking recognized that Understanding nature's laws on the terms of particle physics left unanswered the question of how to apply those laws to any but the simplest of systems. Predictability is one thing in a cloud chamber where two particles collide at the end of a race around an accelerator. It is something else altogether in the simplest tub of roiling fluid or in the Earth's weather or in the human brain. Hawking's physics efficiently gathering up Nobel Prizes and big money for experiments, has often been called a revolution. At times, it seemed within reach of that grail of science, the grand unified theory, or theory of everything. Physics had traced the development of energy and matter in all but the first eye blink of the universe's history. But was post-war particle physics a revolution? Or was it just the fleshing out of the framework laid down by Einstein, Bohr, and the other fathers of relativity and quantum mechanics. Certainly, the achievements of physics, from the atomic bomb to the transistor, changed the 20th century landscape. Yet, if anything, the scope of particle physics seemed to have narrowed. Two generations had passed since the field produced a new theoretical idea that changed the way non-specialists understand the world. The physics described by Hawking could complete its mission without answering some of the most fundamental questions about nature. How does life begin? What is turbulence? Above all, in a universe ruled by entropy, drawing inexorably toward greater and greater disorder, how does order arise? At the same time, objects of everyday experience, like fluids and mechanical systems, came to seem so basic and so ordinary, the physicists had a natural tendency to assume that they were well understood. It was not so. As the revolution in chaos runs its course, the best physicists find themselves returning without embarrassment to phenomena on a human scale. They study not just galaxies, but clouds. They carry out profitable computer research, not just on craze, but on Macintoshes. The premier journals print articles on the strange dynamics of a ball bouncing on a table side by side with articles on quantum physics. The simplest systems are now seen to create extraordinarily difficult problems of predictability. Yet, order arises spontaneously in those systems, chaos and order together. Only a new kind of science could begin to cross the great gulf between knowledge of what one thing does, one water molecule, one cell of a uh, heart tissue, one neuron, and what millions of them do. Watch two bits of foam flowing side by side at the bottom of a waterfall. What can you guess about how close they were at the top? Nothing. As far as standard physics was concerned, God might just as well have taken all those water molecules under the table and shuffled them personally. Traditionally, when physicists saw complex results, they looked for complex causes. When they saw a random relationship between what goes into a system and what comes out, they assumed that they would have to build randomness into any realistic theory by artificially adding noise or error. 
the modern study of chaos began with the creeping realization in the 1960s that quite simple mathematical equations could model systems every bit as violent as a waterfall. Tiny differences in input could quickly become overwhelming differences in output, a phenomenon given the name sensitive dependence on initial conditions. In weather, for example, this translates into what is only half-jokingly known as the butterfly effect. The notion that a butterfly stirring the air today in Peking can transform storm systems next month in New York. When the explorers of chaos began to think back on the genealogy of their new science, they found many intellectual trails from the past. But one stood out very clearly. For the young physicists and mathematicians leading the revolution, a starting point was the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect. The sun beat down through a sky that had never seen clouds. The wind swept across an earth as smooth as glass. Night never came, and autumn never gave way to winter. It never rained. The simulated weather in Edward Lorenz's new electronic computer changed slowly, but certainly, drifting through a permanent dry midday season, as if the world had turned into Camelot, or some particularly bland version of Southern California. Outside his window, Lorenz could watch real weather, the early morning fog creeping along the Massachusetts Institute of Technology campus, or the low clouds slipping over the rooftops from the Atlantic. Fog and clouds never arose in the model running on his computer. The machine, a Royal MACD, was a thicket of wiring and vacuum tubes that occupied an ungainly part of Lorenz's office, made a surprising and irritating noise, and broke down every week or so. It had neither the speed nor the memory to manage a realistic simulation of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. Yet Lorenz created a toy weather in 1960 that succeeded in mesmerizing his colleagues. Every minute the machine marked the passing of a day by printing a row of numbers across a page. If you knew how to read the printouts, you would see a prevailing westerly wind swing now to the north, now to the south, now back to the north. Digitized cyclones spun slowly around an idealized globe. As word spread through the department, the other meteorologists would gather around with the graduate students, making bets on what Lorenz's weather would do next. Somehow, nothing ever happened the same way twice. Lorenz enjoyed weather, by no means a prerequisite for a research meteorologist. He savored its changeability. He appreciated the patterns that come and go in the atmosphere, families of eddies and cyclones, always obeying mathematical rules, yet never repeating themselves. When he looked at clouds, he thought he saw a kind of structure in them. Once he had feared that studying the science of weather would be like prying a jack-in-the-box apart with a screwdriver. Now he wondered whether science would be able to penetrate the magic at all. Weather had a flavor that could not be expressed by talking about averages. The daily high temperature in Cambridge, Mass., averages 75 degrees in June. The number of rainy days in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, averages 10 a year. These were statistics. The essence was the way patterns in the atmosphere changed over time. And that was what Lawrence captured in the Royal MacBee. To most serious meteorologists, Forecasting was less than science. It was a seat-of-the-pants business performed by technicians who needed some intuitive ability to read the next day's weather in the instruments and the clouds. It was guesswork. At centers like MIT, meteorology favored problems that had solutions. Lorentz understood the messiness of weather prediction as well as anyone, but he harbored an interest in the problem, a mathematical interest. Not only did meteorologists scorn forecasting, but in the 1960s, virtually all serious scientists mistrusted computers. These souped-up calculators hardly seemed like tools for theoretical science, so numerical weather modeling was something of a bastard problem. Yet the time was right for it. Weather forecasting had been waiting two centuries for a machine that could repeat thousands of calculations over and over again by brute force. 